Okay, the dramatic dimming of the lights. I think that means that we can begin. Um, so thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you so much for our panelists who are going to take it away momentarily and have a really, I think, interesting um, conversation that everybody's going to enjoy. Um, I'm Helona Norton Westbrook. I am the Mellon Fellow here at the Toledo Museum of Art. I'm also the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art here at the museum. Um, along with Amy Gelman, who's our Associate Director, I curated the Playtime exhibition, which is on now, um, which I hope you have seen or are going to see after this. Uh, so Playtime is a little bit of an experimental exhibition for us in a couple of ways. First of all, um, it's not contained to one space within the museum. So there's one kind of um, work that's a big hook, if you will, that's in Canada called Harmonic Motion, which um, you may have seen already, which is a large indoor crocheted playground that you can climb in and it's for adults and children. Um, so that is part of the Playtime exhibition, but that is by no means all of the Playtime exhibition. There's that work. There's other works um, throughout the museum. There's a work called Swing Space by an artist named Jillian Mayer, a Cuban-American artist working in Miami, um, whose work is really interactive in that it swings in the gallery space against a projection of clouds, and you can have this kind of ethereal and dreamlike experience all under the kind of guise of play and the idea of just infusing life with wonder um, and those moments that come so easily to us as children, but that we start to kind of lose a, a grasp of as we get older. And that's really um, what we're trying to do with everything in the exhibition. The exhibition um, is also a little bit unique in that it has elements that pop up, so they're not here for the duration of the exhibition. Um, so we are having one of those this weekend out on the front terrace. That is uh, Red Moon Theater, who is visiting. Uh, their residency here started Thursday and extends until tonight. And they are doing a series of um, performances with sitar players, with opera singers, with aerialists. So I would encourage you to go check that out as well. And we are also really pleased as part of this exhibition to have this collaboration with Dustin and, the, um, and everyone here through the creation of Festhetic. Um, uh, the addition that was made specifically to kind of celebrate playtime, to go with playtime. It's really in lieu of a traditional catalog, since we didn't think this was a very traditional show, that instead collaborating with Dustin um, to create this special edition of Festhetic was a lot more appropriate. And I will let him speak more to that. Uh, but first, I wanted to introduce who is on our panel today. So we have Dustin Hostetler. Want to give a wave? OK. Um, Dustin is the creator of Festhetic, which is now in its 15th year, believe it or not. This is the 14th issue. Yeah. And um, to kind of hear Dustin speak about it, it really started. Well, do you want to say a word about it first, I guess? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I started publishing Festhetic in 2001. Um, it was partially in response to uh, there was a peripheral proliferation, I didn't say that word right, of PDF zines. A lot of artists around the world were making these collaborative zines, emailing them to each other, um, collaborating, but there weren't printed archives, and I'm a bit of an archivist, I'm a bit of a collector, and I wanted to make something that, sort of in response to these digital magazines, that was an actual printed version, sort of same idea of international collaboration artists around the world. Um, I also really wanted to make something that was sort of a time capsule. Um, so that when you'd grab an issue from, say, 2007, you'd look at it and you'd feel like, yes, this really aesthetically represents 2007. Um, the name Fasthetic is the fast aesthetic. That's where it comes from. It's a response to the notion that we live in a world where there's so many images and ideas and things bombarding us all the time through the internet and television and all other forms of media that sort of slowing it down, documenting it, um, and just having an archive of annual creativity. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining it. Um, and sitting next to Dustin is Matthew Hoffman. And um, he, we are really pleased to have him here, all the way from Chicago. 
And Matthew has done many kind of public art projects. He has a really strong presence in Chicago and across the country. Um, he's very well known. And uh, can I read some of your recent accolades? I hope I don't embarrass you. But um, he was recently recognized in the New City's design top 50 of Who Shaped Chicago 2014. So very cool. And was awarded Best Established Artist in the Chicago Reader's Public Poll. So Matthew Hoffman, thank you for being here. Um, next to him is Gemma Hostetler, who is Dustin's wife, and also um, I think the only artist to have been featured in every edition of Festhetic so far. <laughs> so that's pretty impressive. Um, and Gemma, did you want to say a little bit about your um, art practice that kind of crosses fine arts and design? Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, went to school for painting, um, but kind of dropped out in the early uh, mid-90s to go into web as it was beginning, and um, uh, was coding websites um, and working digitally, and uh, eventually uh, needed some playtime of my own, and so started doing art projects online, and um, just early net art sort of that shtick, yeah. Great, and uh, next to Gemma is Michelle Dooney, who has a wonderful website that I encourage you all to check out. Um, Michelle is an artist living and working in Toledo. Um, on her website, there is one of the most charming videos I've seen in a while called, is it called Drawing Up? Yeah, that kind of, um, how would you describe it, Michelle? Uh, I guess kind of like a short diary of how I started drawing and why I continue drawing and a couple of the downfalls along the way. And <laughs> I guess and it's kind of one of those, if you're here to do it, you should be doing it type videos, I guess. Absolutely. Um, so now that we are um, familiar with everybody on the panel, I'm going to hand it over to Dustin to take it away and have a conversation and I will jump in as needed. Great. So um, I wanted to first, two things. Uh, I encourage questions. So I want this to be as interactive as it can be. So raise your hand at any point. I think that's always fun to have a, a dialogue, a group dialogue. Um, on the, uh, the slideshow here is just basically all of the submissions. Actually, this is Gemma's work right here. Uh, all the submissions from this issue of Aesthetic, along with some highlights of everybody's work here. You'll, you'll notice Matthew's work is the, the wood carved, uh, wood, wood cut letter forms. Matthew is the cover artist for Fasthetic. Um, Michelle's is going to be uh, watercolor illustrations. Uh, her submission was sort of comic book toned uh, entry. That's yeah, more Gemma's work here. Um, so to talk a little bit more about Fasthetic, uh, the origins 2001, like I said, uh, started as a Xeroxed uh, just zine stapled at the the office I worked at on the weekends. I just I'd make it when nobody was looking with the Xerox. And uh, sold it online, made about 250 copies the year one, sold them very quickly, and realized that the web was going to be a great venue to get this kind of stuff out. I actually tried selling them in Toledo. I'd take them to Boogie Records, those types of places, and wouldn't be able to sell more than a copy when I dropped them off. Um, so I realized the, the outside world was definitely going to be where I needed to focus on if I wanted to keep doing this. Um, because issue one sold so quickly and uh, boosted my confidence, I actually invested a little bit of money and in issue two I actually had it uh, offset printed, did a thousand copies and once again sold out very quickly. Um, and because of the success of those first two years I ended up getting some outside attention from different sponsors and it went from a black and white zine at 60 pages to a full color, you know, th now it's 128 pages and offset printed and uh, much higher quality than that first issue. Uh, but it was always an opportunity for me to interact with artists I wanted to interact with. Um, living in Toledo, obviously I have all the Toledo artists I'm in love with, but you know, there's that cool guy in Chicago or that cool lady in Paris. How do I interact with those people? And I, I thought, well, if I can give them a venue to publish their work, that's always uh, a great intro conversation. So uh, it's always been a great opportunity for me to basically find people that I think, oh, that person's really cool and then use this as the opportunity to get to know them. Um, and so basically the way it always works is for each issue there's a theme, both color a color theme and a conceptual theme. And so I've 
for example. There's a doomsday issue where it's all black, white, and red art. Uh, for this one, for the playtime issue, uh, the, co the color scheme was black and pink. But I didn't specify what color pink you had to use, because I kind of like the notion of flipping through the issue and you get a general sense that there's a color palette, but it changes throughout the issue. Um, and so what's fun about this is that a lot of times the artists that I've contacted, maybe the work that they do has no connection to the themes whatsoever. Uh, and it kind of forces them to make new work. They can't just pull something out that they've made that they always wanted published. It has to be sort of site specific. Um, and also it's a challenge because I, I tell you the colors you have to use and like pink's not the easiest color to use if you're, uh, you know, a heavy metal type of person. Um, and so for this issue, one of the fun things that I, why I wanted to do was, I'm currently working out of Chicago and Matthew I'm a huge fan of in general. Um, and so early on in the creation of the magazine, I, I invited him to be the cover artist. And then we had several months of conversation about what the cover would look like. And I'd love for you to talk a bit about the origin stories of the cover. Yeah, sure. So um, even though I spent 11 years in the design industry, I try to never do graphic design. Um, <laughs> so I wanted the cover to be uh, uh, more like an installation. And we were playing around with some different ideas. And I think the first big one I had was that we were going to build play out of huge letters. And they were going to be black in a white field and have a snowball fight around it. Because it was winter at the time when we started talking about it. But realizing that this was going to come out in the summer, it, didn't, it seemed like that might be a little off. So um, I spent most of my childhood in Ohio. And we moved around from different cities. And every time uh, we moved, I was always making these creations. And they were like racetracks or little games and things. And so it fit perfectly with the theme of playtime. And so every time we moved, we would throw them all out. But my mom would take a picture of them with me. And so in the magazine, there's some really uh, embarrassing photos of me in some pink shorts um, with, <laughs> with these racetracks. Um, but so that's where the, the whole idea of the racetrack, making um, the words playtime came from. Uh, so we uh, built it, uh, I believe it was um, eight feet tall, um, and you know, built it full size. Even the barcode basically like, created the magazine and then scaled it out. Um, so the barcode was about this big. Um, but it should be, I think, is it scannable? It is scannable. scannable. Okay, yeah. nice. Um, and uh, yeah, and then just uh, sort of put it all together, built it out of wood, and then uh, photographed it to have it scaled down. And so the back cover gives you a hint of sort of how it was made. There was a funny moment, and the pictures will come up again in a second. They're, this is just cycling through, but you'll, you'll get a sense of what he's talking about with the, the scale of it. Um, I knew he was going to do it out of wood, and I knew he was going to laser cut these pieces of wood and, and make something, but never in our conversation did he tell me the scale of how big things were going to be. Matthew, in general, likes to throw a little twist, a little bit of humor and stuff. But even in our back and forth within the email conversation, when he sent me the JPEG of the cover to say, this is what it looks like, I made a comment to him about the barcode. And is that, you know, did you scale? I wasn't sure if that was 100%. I, you know, I gave him a little barcode file. And I wasn't sure if that was the exact same size or had he changed it. And he made some casual comment about, oh, it should be fine. It's, you know, six by nine. But it was basically six by nine feet, not six by nine inches. <laughs> and it wasn't until he finally gave me the final art and I got the back cover. And I was like, holy, holy smokes, because you'll, you'll see there's just this moment of like, the back cover, if you haven't seen it yet, is all of the wood on the front cover flipped over. And then sort of uh, he's arranging the pieces. And then there's somebody else above him taking a shot on their, on their iPhone. And just the sense of scale, it's one of the one of the more playful twists in the magazine, because the reveal, you know, if you only ever see the front, like even on the uh, Festhetic website, we only show the front cover, because unless you come to the TMA and you see the copy here, buying one online, you won't get this reveal till it gets pulled out of the envelope and you see this back cover. And I just think it's a really clever, um, clever play. Because um, you never realize when you see it that that barcode is, is so huge. I think it might be the next sequence here. Um, Maybe not. Yeah, so you can see he actually built the scale of the letters and actually have the cars, you know, because when you're seeing it at six by nine, you'd never guess that all the detail was in there. Um, yeah, the barcode you can see is gigantic. We actually did an event a couple weeks ago in Chicago where he built 
a door sized version of the cover and it was the door you had to walk through to get into the event. So um, his, his art is very scalable. So um, I was gonna ask Michelle to talk a little bit about uh, your, your thought process on the playtime. Uh, it should show up here in a, in a couple minutes, but just talk a bit about your creation. Well, I've recently really gotten into graphic novels and I think just lately it's gotten to be very huge to see um, comic artists doing more like uh, confessional comics in a weird way. Um, and sometimes when I do my comics, I, I don't realize that I, I think that I'm coming up with someone different and then I have people say, is that you as a little girl? And I, and I don't realize it, but it actually kind of is me. <laughs> and then it turns out that my mom is also in the comic, but uh, of the one that we put up. But I guess my process kind of is, uh, um, I, I guess I thought Playtime was one of the best themes that I could have ever had for being invited to be in Facetic. I've never understood why when we become adults, we're discouraged to play. We're told to become serious and focus on your job. And I think that that makes, um, makes you lose a little bit of something. So I guess I'm known as a person that has the costume parties with the theme where I think I just recently had an outer space party where I said, if you don't know what you're doing, just get some tin foil and put it on yourself and, <laughs> and come up with rather than, when people think watercolor these days, they think of a landscape often. And I like to do it a little bit more of a illustration, a little bit tighter and dreamy, I guess, is the way I would put it. Can you um, talk just a little bit about your specific uh, work that was in this edition of Facetetic? Yes. Uh, I didn't really give it a title or anything. Um, it's kind of a comic that has to do with a mother telling their little girl, don't go play in the woods. I think a lot of us have had that moment when we were growing up where your parents told you not to do something. And because of that, it was so appealing that you wanted to do it. And you might have done it. I mean, some of us probably went into the woods when we were told not to. <coughs> My mom out there, she probably can nod and say yes. Uh, but the whole comic had this little girl that was uh, going against what she was supposed to do because the fierce want to play and do something that was maybe a little bit dangerous. So she goes out into the woods and uh, she meets some creatures which are having a smoke break, I guess you can say. Uh, and I kind of wanted to leave it a little bit open at the end because I, I think there's a great thing with art being interpreted by the person in your own memories and your own things that have happened in life. For me, I don't really want to say if I say it ended well or not, but the last panel has the mother uh, with her flashlight on a shoe. That could mean many things. Maybe she went off with these creatures and had a good time, or maybe not. You know, I, I've always liked that about art in general, about it being about the interpretation with your own memories and the own things that you grew up with to say how you might see something like that. Her panel should be coming up here. We did, we did a wonderfully poorly timed thing where sometimes it's perfect and sometimes it's not. Um, and actually, uh, Michelle has a couple pieces in the museum store as of uh, this week, yeah? This week will be, yeah. So stop on by and take a look. Um, one of the things that I think is really fun as well with the magazine, because it has this color theme, is flipping through, in pl the playtime theme actually works really well, but, but seeing how the pieces interact with each other, because for each, theme for each issue, there tends to be some general common thoughts. So like there's a luck, I did a luck issue. And of course, rabbit feet shows up like a dozen times, but not in a row. You know, you'll, there's the rabbit foot again, there's the rabbit foot again. And it's just kind of fun to see um, everybody's interpretation because some people take playtime literal, like throwing a ball, right? And some people take playtime literal like Matthew and they're playing with you, they're messing with you. And I think that's really an interesting thing because it's kind of like walking through the museum, right? Like it's all art. It's not all themed, but how they all work together and how the pieces interact with each other I think is really fascinating. Um, I think this is gonna be Michelle's. I'm pretty positive this is gonna be Michelle's, right? There it is, okay. 
Um, and you know, I was really excited. Michelle's a good example. I love Michelle's work, and I've seen it around Toledo, at Artomatic, at different arts-related things here. And it was really fun for me to see how she would respond. You know, you don't know when you ask somebody like, "I like your work," and then sometimes they give you something back that's not what you expected at all, and you're not disappointed, but like, "Hmm, that's not why I invited you." Um, you know, and that makes sense. Actually, there, there's somebody in this issue that uh, I really like their paintings. I'm a big fan of their. All the, all the paintings they do. I'm, they all, I only know him as a painter. And his submission was a collage that had no paintings in it whatsoever. And I will always publish what I'm given because my thought is if I like the artist, I trust the artist, I've invited you to be a part of it, that's as much editing as I do. That's where my curation stops. Um, but that piece in particular that I got, I was like, hmm, that's really not what, and I actually said to him, like, I, this is interesting, but what happened, you know? <laughs> and his explanation was like, well, I'm making all these little maquettes now, and I make these pieces, and then they inform my paintings, and so my next series of paintings will be inspired by this submission I gave you. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm all right with that, because now I'm looking forward to seeing what those paintings look like. Or here's a good example of those photos, like it's somebody playing with light, right? Like it's light on their face, and you don't at first, if you saw it outside of the context, you wouldn't think play at all, but when you put it next to all the other playful things that sort of retells stories. It's, I, I think it's just fun to f flip through repeatedly and s to make those connections. Can I ask a question about the what you've mentioned about color being an important aspect as well as having a theme? I'm just wondering if that's something that you knew kind of from the get-go with, with Fasthetic or if it's something that has developed over time. So starting as a black and white magazine, the first four issues were black and white. I like that the black and white tone unified all the art, so it worked in the same way as having an extra color. It was, you flip through, it, there's this, this dense tone throughout, and it, sometimes you don't even notice when one submission ends and the next one starts. And so when I had the option to print full color, that seemed too drastic of a shift. So I just did one color to start, and I, I, it worked perfectly. The artist took that, here's the one that I thought was gonna be a painting, and ends up being this. Um, I, I, it worked perfectly in the same way the black and white worked. And so I did originally just black and white plus a spot color. So I was actually doing two color. And when I finally could afford to do full, full color, I didn't want to lose that. And so like I said, I'm still telling people the tone, but like there's obviously yellow and blue, but overall the pink feeling as you're flipping through. I just think it really is an important part of the parameters I'm putting on the artist. One thing I should note is that I never do that for the cover. So like you'll notice Matthew's covers Browns with colors. Um, I never wanted it to. Uh, I never wanted the cover for whatever reason to define that. So it's just sort of an intro, and then then the colors. There's another great guy, Chad Corey. He's actually another Chicago artist that's going to be working with the museum in the future. There's a lot of great interaction between the Toledo Museum of Art and the outside world. I've been really excited. I, I wanted to tell this story that you kind of you sort of hinted at, but when I first heard about the playtime theme show, this was about two years ago. I was the chair of the Circle 2445, the younger adult group here at the museum, and so I was a little hip to shows before they were being announced, and when I heard about the playtime theme, my thought was, of all the shows the museum could ever collaborate with me on, this would be the show. And so I emailed Brian Kennedy, like basically as soon as I heard about the theme, and I said, well, long shot here, but what do you think? And he responded almost immediately, he was like, that's great, let's do it. And I never thought he was going to say yes. And so this has been a really, for me, like thrilling thing because growing up in Toledo and having a museum being such a big part of my life. I mean, museums in general are obviously important to society, but this is like my museum. And so to be able to have this collaboration is just like the most playfully wonderful thing that I, can, <laughs> I could have ever imagined. So it's, it's been a really cool process. Um, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, I just thought maybe the... Okay, all three just turned and looked at me. <laughs> Why not? So maybe, yeah. uh, could we hear a little bit more from Gemma about um, maybe your... <laughs> I'm really interested, you know, because um, you have, a, you know, being an artist that's contributed to all these editions of Aesthetic, you have a different perspective than Dustin, I would imagine, and, I, and I'm interested to hear that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Dustin and I even met or flirted or started dating until maybe like issue six or something. So I, 
But I do remember that he sent me my first copy of the first issue with a handwritten letter in it, and I thought that was really kind of cool. Um, and I kept it in the issue, but didn't. It clearly took me six years to get this yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very patient. I can talk a little bit about my process in yeah. play because I, I'm definitely like, because I'm a, a digital, I'm definitely a little bit different from most of his contributors. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I did go to school for painting and um, when I kind of got burnt out with, with paint, with art school and was like, okay, I need to uh, do something different. When I was really young, my grandfather had made me take computer classes um, and I was learning to code like in sixth grade in basic and logo. I don't know if anybody remembers those languages. So when the web first started, I was like, oh yeah, let's um, go ahead and uh, drop out of art school and get a job uh, making websites. And um, which forced me to start to use things like Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and whatever um, digital art tools there were, mostly Adobe. Um, and back then, a lot of the software was easy to crash and easy to break, and um, things just weren't stable. And on my off time, when I was tired of coding or whatever, I needed to get that art side of my personality like satiated and would start playing around with Illustrator and Photoshop and uh, starting to break things and use tools that in ways that they weren't intended to. So I think that my process is very play where I'm allowing myself um, to experiment to fail, although I don't, I don't think when you're playing, you're not really thinking about, oh, I just made a failure there. It's like, oh, I did this, and this is what happens when you do that. Mm -hmm. Like, you run too fast, and uh, you fall down. Um, and so my process is really in, in that you know, space where I'm not, don't have a, a specific end goal of what my work is going to look like at the end. And um, you get all these really fun, happy accidents and things that people aren't expecting to see because nobody's taken that Photoshop plug-in and made it have errors come up and then crash the file halfway and able to save a post postscript file out of it and bring it back into Illustrator and open it up and see this like mash of stuff you would never have tried, even tried to uh, accomplish on your own. That's great, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's fun to watch. I mean, a lot of the artists that are in Festhetic Gem obviously being the best example, but it's, it's fun for me as well to watch everybody's process change over the years. Or, uh, like for example, so this, Matthew is a, the cover artist this year, but known him for a while and actually he corrected me a couple weeks ago when I was noting a piece that I, when he first started making these wood uh, words, that cut out word, word, wood words that he could sell, you could buy, um, I didn't realize until he pointed out that they were originally hand cut. I had just assumed from day one they were laser cut. Now they're laser cut. But to see the process change, even if it's just little refinements, you know, to like see Gemma's work, you can tell in issue one versus issue 14, it's sort of the same person, but like her process is changing over the years. And same with the magazine itself, from black and white to full colors, you know. The the themes only started like in issue three. I didn't have themes for the first couple of issues. Um, it's just kind of fun to have this really long conversation with a lot of people. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's got to be, I don't know, 700 artists that I've published over the past 15 years, and uh, some of them are repeat, bring them back, or bring them back now that they're working in a new collaborative and all of the friends come in and contribute. Um, it's just really interesting to have these long-term dialogues with people. And it is, it's, pl the playtime theme, once again, for me, really resonates probably more than any other theme. 
because every other theme was also I'm playing I'm playing regardless whether the it's doomsday is the theme or infinity is the theme I'm still there's this playful conversation um, and I think that's partly there's two reasons I think this issue ended up turning out so well and one was that that theme kind of resonated just generally with everybody but two I think everybody was so excited to be part of a museum edition because I mean there's no question that's a pretty exciting thing to be a part of a museum project or a product. And it just felt like every, as these submissions were coming in for this year, I mean, and I'm always excited to get them because you give them a deadline, nobody ever hits the deadline, and a couple weeks later, things start coming in. And uh, for this issue, things came in early. I mean, people were actually like proactively trying to get me, you know. And then like, like actually this is a good submission where she sent me one version and then like two weeks later she was still working on it, I wasn't happy with it, sent me another version. There's, there's actually, you'll, there's a slide in here where there's a, a man dancing and there's little dresses flying up and uh, there's, sees like spinning and the original submission, this one, I got two files for this one. One, the first one was this, this man but he was hairy, he was just covered in hair. And I actually really liked that submission but then a month later, actually right before I was going to go to press, He's like, I've, you know, I've been thinking about it. I, I got, the hair's got to go. And he sent me that version. I was like, <laughs> I'm a little disappointed, but that's okay. It's your submission. Um, another thing that I want to know, just as a general excitement, um, I'll, I'll point out if a slide comes up, but we've done some really interesting uh, swag for this issue. Um, previous years, I've always done something, like maybe the issue came with a button, or maybe you could buy a T-shirt. Um, for this issue, we've done, I think, four shirts, uh, a handkerchief or a bandana, a tea towel, a frisbee, puffy stickers, and iron-on patches. Um, that the museum totally initiated all this. Like they saw the work, and instantly the museum store was like, "That would be amazing on this." And that, and it's been so fun to see, like, to get the samples in. Like I've got this frisbee that you just can't even believe it exists because it's got full-color little troll characters all over it, and it's like this makes no sense. It's amazing. Um, or the tea towel, like I, I didn't know, I, this is, I should have known this, I didn't know tea towels were a thing, but if you go Google museum tea towels, like they are a serious thing, and the fact that we did a tea towel is pretty incredible. Um, I just, it's been a really, the whole project, the whole basically year and a half of, of working on this has been really, really interesting. Did you want to talk about the special sensory aspect of this? Yeah, so uh, at some point, and I'll point it out, there's, there's a black and white two panel uh, comic. And uh, a friend of mine, his name's Jason Poland. He's a very, actually he, he has a book coming out called Everyone in New York. It's actually being published by Chronicle Press in next month. And he's, a, he's an OCD type of character where he literally, for the past 10 years, has been drawing everybody in New York City. He'll just sit down and all day just draw people. If they're a celebrity, he'll note who they are, make little notes, black and white little scribbles. Um, he drew everything in the MoMA in New York, and then the MoMA published a book called Everything in the MoMA, and it's just drawings of everything in the MoMA. And I've known Jason since basically issue one because he's from Ann Arbor, now, now a New York native, basically. But uh, issue two or three of Aesthetic, Every issue of the thousand issues came with an original draft drawing. He gave me a thousand draft drawings. That's just his level of commitment to, to projects. And so for this issue, um, I wanted to do a scratch and sniff page. The printer here in town, Homewood Press, one of the, actually one of the reasons we picked Homewood was he said, oh, by the way, we can do scratch and sniff. And I was like, ooh. This is, and so I, I invited Jason to do a scratch and sniff page because I just was really curious to see what, of all people, his OCD kind of tent, you know, would, would do. And I kept asking him, I, I really need it, I really need your submission, I really need your submission. And he just wasn't coming, he was busy, he's a very busy guy. And he finally sent me this little sequence and it's just a guy going throughout his day and then he ends up eating a hamburger. And if you scratch the hamburger, it actually smells like meat. And uh, he picked the smell, you know, he could have picked banana or vanilla or anything else, but that was you know, meat. And actually, the printer was like, you sure you want to go with meat? How about bacon? They're like, no, we're doing meat. Um, and then he got his issue in the mail, and there's this great Instagram post where it's just, uh, he tends to do long form uh, Instagram posts where he just sort of tells a story. And long story short, in his mind, this entire issue was a scratch and sniff. And everybody was doing a scratch and sniff, scratch and sniff submission. And when he got it and realized his was the only one and it was meat smell. <laughs> and it was the second to last page in this issue. And, and I know I highlighted it in the, in the masthead, the table of contents there. I, I actually highlighted it so you, because it'd be very easy to miss it. 
Um, he was both embarrassed and totally amazed that the, it, it, he would have done a totally different submission had he understood the project a little bit differently. Um, so there's something kind of exciting about, you know, once again, I leave it on the artist. They get to do whatever they want. That's really funny. And I have to say, I really admire, you know, what you say that you just leave it to the artists. Um, I mean, has there ever been a time that you've gotten a submission and you just thought, Here's, this isn't, that's it. there's the scratch and sniff. Yeah. Burger scratch and sniff, yeah. You just thought this isn't right uh, for this edition or do you just always include it? So there have been, I, I tried, first of all, it's kind of hard to pace these things because like I know it's gonna be 128 pages to get that exact amount of art, me, and what if an artist decides they only wanna do one page last minute or four pages, it's hard to, I've always had that dance at the end is, is, is tough. Um, I would say in the 15 years I've been doing this, I've probably had three or four submissions where there was no way I was gonna print it because it was just maybe something too extreme um, and I just tell the people that I'm like, listen, I'm, you know, we don't, there's no contracts here. It's all like, let's just have a conversation. This should work. Um, but, but no, it's very rare because I, I do give a lot of thought to who's going to be in that issue. Meaning I probably right. have right now a reserve of 300 artists ready to do, if I could do five more issues this year, I could. Yeah. Um, but I try to make the mix interesting so that it's not too much of one thing. It's not like just photography or just they try to mix it so I know that's one thing that people have really commented on here in the museum that it's just such a wonderful mix of artists and styles in this um, edition and in all the editions but particularly you know this one is pretty amazing in that sense you know it just um, it really hits a, a great note my my goal you know once again I tried to sell these in Toledo at Boogie Records and the like and I never really had an audience right and now there's this like audience given to me and it's all of Toledo right because pretty much everybody from Toledo is going to come here whether they buy a copy or not they're probably going to flip through an issue and while I don't think anybody's going to look at that and immediately like oh that makes sense you know like I, I think there is some some thought to you have to kind of like figure out contextually what this all means I wanted to make it as user friendly as possible I wanted mm -hmm. it to make the most sense because I've definitely had some issues where they're a little rough around the edges or they're a little too strange. Yeah, and I have to say, I mean, I think that it was a stroke of genius to use the pink in this because there's something about the color pink, right, that people either are, they really want to work with it or it's the last thing they would choose, sort of. Yeah, how did you guys feel about using pink? Was there any, I mean, you didn't have to, but uh, you, you didn't use much pink in yours. Pink has never been my favorite color, but I do agree about it being a very, a very playful color. And it really worked well with the story that I was telling because I did have a pair of pink tennis shoes. And if you really think about the mid 80s, there was a lot of that kind of mauve pink color that was going on. So it just worked out perfectly for, for the playtime thing for me. Kim, how about you? I think I was the one that told you to, to use pink. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Did I like using it myself? No, it's not an easy color to use, and it's so hard, like, not knowing how things are going to show up in print versus mm -hmm. when I'm working on screen. That's an issue that I have. Um, I definitely didn't hit the color pink I was trying to hit when I saw it printed, but say la vie. Yeah, the price tag's pink on the cover, too. That's true. There, You did, thank you. You did follow the theme. <laughs> I, will, oh, I was say, we will note that I, so you, the internet is how this thing exists, right? Like, it's all, it's always been coordinated via email, and now Google Docs, everything is just I'm online for me. Um, I tweeted out six months ago, right before I started working on actually getting the submissions in, to everybody that I could on the internet, what would you, what to you is the playful color? And nobody responded, but one person who I don't know, and who doesn't even follow me, so I don't know how they got to that question, and they just wrote back pink. <laughs> and then Jamal suggested pink. I was like, that's funny, because there's another person I don't know on the internet. <laughs> so this is the tea towel art, by the way. Uh, an artist by the name of Paul Octavius, who's known for his photography, but is actually an amazing illustrator. Um, and so that I, there's a playful twist there that anybody that would buy this issue because they like Paul will be very surprised because they're going to expect photos. It's a little playful. Yeah. Um, I, I, can I jump in with a question? 
Um, I was just wondering, you know, for, for each of the artists here, when you first heard that playtime was the theme, I'm interested to hear kind of your process in terms of what you considered doing um, and what you actually ended up doing. Like, how did you get from where you started to where you ended? I guess I'll start. I, I bought really nice paper for once and left it on my table for probably two weeks with just the outline of how, just the outline of actually making something with rulers has always been tough for me, so having an actual specific size um, is, makes it a little bit, I guess, tougher for me because it's, it, you have to think outside and inside that little box. And, but I guess I, uh, I took my time to kind of get started and, and I hope that I wouldn't make a mistake because with watercolor, it's not a very easy to control um, aspect and I just hope that each panel did not accidentally run off <laughs> and it, it just turned out, I guess, how it did. Gemma? Um, yeah, I think the most, the, the real playful thing came into I've got this uh, really weird um, camo pattern thing that I've been messing around with where I'm trying to use camo but in a way that's kind of twisted by gingham tablecloth pattern stuck into the camouflage pattern and um, I was just trying to make something unexpected and silly um, with that. I don't, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, pink. Yeah, and pink. And pink. Uh, what about you, Matthew? Well, I, I talked a little bit about that, how we kind of started in a different place. Um, and then I just kept racking my brain on play, 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 play. And I, I keep a pretty ridiculous schedule. Like we do a lot of big projects or tons of small projects all the time. And so doing all this full time, it gets a little, well, no play anymore, yeah. it feels like. And uh, so I just started, I just f somehow got back to remembering about those projects that I did as a kid. Um, and as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, I've got it. And the car is the top-down view of a 1986 Iraq T-top, because um, my dad sold cars, and he would, on, my, on our birthdays, we he would drive us around in the coolest car you could get. And so, <laughs> one birthday, that was the year. And so I just tried to get back to when things were simpler, and when things were uh, a bit more fun, and um, tried to push that all into to one thing. Actually, I, I mentioned this, Matthew heard this briefly a couple a month or so ago. Um, for me, the big thing was the cover artist, because I mean, it's easy for the inside artist to just give them a theme and sort of organize chaos, see what happens. But the cover, setting a tone for the whole issue, that's for me the biggest challenge. And uh, when I had first uh, temporarily relocated, or when I first started relocating to Chicago for work, um, a friend of mine, uh, some of you may know Mark Moffat, uh, was also visiting Chicago and he said, hey, let's drive around the city and just look at all the things that were in the places we're not supposed to go. And so basically we spent a day driving around South Chicago just looking for murals and art. So actually keep, note, note this thing right here because that's going to come up. Um, so we're just driving around and he had said, we have to go down to this, uh, this little town called Pullman. It's like the southernmost tip of Chicago. Um, and he said he heard there's some cool things going on. He, he just heard about like a historic neighborhood. Um, so we pull into this neighborhood that I'm totally unfamiliar with and uh, he's like, let's get out of the car and walk around. I'm like, are you sure? I don't know if this is safe. I don't know where we are. And he's like, no, I think it's safe. And as he turned the corner, there's this giant gopher it in wood on this, this like stage. I was like, that, that's Matt. Okay, it was fine. And we get out of the car and walked around and it was like, it set this really interesting tone where just seeing that sculpture not only made me feel safe and have a sense of place, but I felt like happy and it felt like, and you know, knowing in my head this playtime thing that it was kind of like, oh man, that's instantly just, it resonated that th how powerful, you know, certain works can speak to you. And that particular moment was just an aha moment for me. And I, it felt so cool because it actually was opening like the next day. He had just installed it like the night before. And I knew he was installing something. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know where Pullman was. So this was just totally like, Hap, you know, happenstance that I happened to just stroll in there, but it just, it was an amazing moment. So that's how I, that's for me was the big interpretation of playtime, was knowing that, like, I, 
hoping he'd say yes, but that, I, that Matthew needed to do the cover. It just, he, he was the right guy. And for him, it's an interesting process because it is all cut wood. So what you sent me as like the final mock-up was just the shapes, but they were not in wood. They were just vector shapes, no color, no texture. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm sure this is going to look great, but I still don't really know what it's going to look like. So. Oh, yeah. Most, I, most like mock-ups look terrible. It's just interesting, the process, too, because, I mean, it's different than getting a, like a doodle with shading and stuff. It was like, it was, the whole process was playful, basically. So, I was going to just open up and see if yeah, anybody had any I, questions. Yeah, we have great minds think alike. So, uh, yeah. How do you, when you don't have an exhibit that inspires you to do a theme, how do you come up with your theme every year? So, um, I first started playing around with really generic themes. Generic but fun themes. So like Doomsday is a I use reference because it's a that was a fun issue because I'm inviting very happy, playful artists to come up with sinister things. And so they did in the most happy way possible. <laughs> um, but then I thought, well, that's kind of boring and I'm gonna run out of things. I mean, am I gonna do love for the next issue? Am I gonna do heartbreak? You know, like so then like I did an infinity issue, I did a UFO themed issue. I did and so for me it's been fun to challenge myself to not be boring with this because I'm gonna eventually, there's only six colors on the color wheel and there's only so many sort of universal feelings, right? So the thought for me has been, how, to, how do I make this as interesting to myself as possible um, so that I'm also the most excited with the output? Um, so that's been the challenge and the fun is, what have I done, both color, I mean, because I've already done a, a turquoise issue, a yellow issue, a red issue, a gold issue. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't done brown yet. I haven't, there's certainly ones I just haven't touched, but like what combination now is most interesting to me? So I, I don't know what the next one would be, but I already have like a list in my head of things that would be fun. And then colors that either I haven't used or haven't used in this context. Or also, I'm also thinking like maybe the next one there's no black and it's like RGB and it's like, there's, there's, there's all sorts of combinations of colors that I'm not even touching yet. So in the end, I want it to be consistently interesting to me because this, if it was the same thing every year, it would get boring after a while. It's such a great idea, Dustin. I just think, you know, um, and really speak so much to kind of your vision, right? I mean, I think so many of us see work by artists and we think, oh, I'd love it if they did something around this theme, but you really just took the initiative to set the theme, invite people to do it, and it's really um, tremendous because then you can share it with other people too. So I really thank you. No, thanks. It, it's fun for me when it's all said and done to see, because now that we're all on the internet for the most part and we're all on social media for the most part, it's interesting to see how different artists' audience respond because there's a couple of people in here who I wasn't following on Instagram. I didn't know they had an audience. I just liked their work. And then they'd snap a picture and they'd at me and they'd at the magazine and thanks, take a look. And then they'd have like 400 likes that first hour. And it's like, whoa, these are all people I don't even know that are liking this and responding and commenting. And it's like really fun to have this larger conversation. Cause you know, you're only printing a thousand copies. In theory, you're only touching a thousand lives, right? It, what the notion is there's like a ripple effect that makes it really interesting and that even if you don't buy one, you'll hopefully see one on your friend's table or one artist in the issue connects to another artist and something comes from that. I just love the notion that there's more to it than just this printed thing. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. <laughs> think of them as completely two different personalities myself like one is I'm specifically solving problems for someone and then the other one is you know it's art being an artist I mean like everybody has their own just like 
internal feelings when they're creating art or whatever, um, whatever that might be, that description, what is art. Um, but I think of them as, as completely separate. Do they sometimes inform each other? Yeah, all the time. I've gotten client projects based off of, you know, some creative director at some agency seeing some of my work on Prate.com and being like, I want to hire you to do something that's actually pretty corporate, but based off of that. But otherwise, in my head, they're pretty separate. So, like, you just want to, like, figure out a way to help motivate them to do more? Or to bring those worlds together? Or... The, like, negate the fear of laying it bare without the context of it being a solution to a problem. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's starting to happen is I can just basically, essentially, like, read the titles of my pieces, you know? So, like, I would just say, go for it. <laughs> and that anything is possible and <laughs> like pretty soon I won't have to um, even explain things anymore I can just sort of just like show photos of, of pieces but um, it, that that definitely is sort of like the underlying thing behind it is that um, everything that I've ever done has been extremely crude and rough in the very beginning I refined in the real world um, so a lot of the, my early stuff is you know, um, beyond uninteresting, you know? And so to kind of, there's this sort of like, like these barriers that you put in to sort of safeguard yourself and you just kind of break through those. Yes. I have some questions about names, mostly for the half -fellers. Um I got here a little late, so I don't know if you addressed this already, but where does the name Fastetic come from? Uh, yeah, I did. I did address it. It's uh, the fast aesthetic. It's the notion that I'm trying to document, trying to pause and document what's going on. Maybe just in my world visually, but in the world in general at that moment, while we're living in a world where we're bombarded by so many different things all at once, TV, all different sorts of media. So, it's a it's a document of a time of a year, a slice of time where I'm do aesthetically documenting things um, as things are flying along. Did you have a couple ideas before you came up with that name and or was it just like right away you thought no. this was? No. The actual, so 2001 was the first issue I actually made a published version of Festhetic but my senior thesis project at BGSU was you'd either redesign a brand or make a new brand and so my new brand was Festhetic Magazine and so there's actually a Point zero five issue that uh, has like articles about my grandma in it and uh, <laughs> is totally like photo based and it was a very graphic designy thing. But no, that's been a word that um, I mean, but all of our gemmas in my projects all have made up names. And I like to attribute names I can own to things, things I can buy dot coms of because nobody else is using that word. So Fastetic was just. Uh, was just a word that I really liked. And I, one thing I didn't mention, it's sort of arbitrary, but um, my big motivation was as a kid, I got access to my, my deceased father's high school bedroom in my grandmother's basement. And uh, she, it was like this time capsule. She just sort of put other storage things in there, but if you pulled all the stuff out, the posters were still on the walls, comic books were still in boxes, and I still have these. There was a box of comic books that I, I pulled out, and I was young and, and very impressionable, and I pulled out all these comic books, and they were all mostly black and white, some very psychedelic and themed, and they were so distinctly late 60s comic books that were like totally independent, no Marvel logo, They who knows how many they printed, but definitely small numbers. He probably got them at a record store or something, and they were just so amazing to me. And so that from, I've, I've for a long time, the notion of documenting time has been really interesting to me. Uh, so in the 90s, uh, all of my web programming friends and everybody that was working in web, we started to recognize pretty quickly that Internic was running out of, which became Network Solutions, were running out of uh, words that are in the dictionary for dot-coms. And so a really smart 
programmer friend of mine wrote a script against the Whois database to find words that were in the dictionary that hadn't been grabbed as dot coms. And I don't know what this would maybe 99, 98. And um, Prate was on the list. And the definition, it, it is a word, it means to uh, talk, idly, chatter, you know, kind of what I'm doing right now. Like prattle. <laughs> yeah, prattle. prattle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not, not really meaningful um, stuff. And I thought, well, that's kind of perfect for what I want to do because I'm not, I don't have a set goal. I'm not trying to, there is no specific message. The medium is the message, really. So I just uh, registered it. And that was it. Mine's not as interesting. Uh, p painting in college, I was painting all these little spacemen and uh, I wanted them to have their own NASA type of thing, and so United Planet Space Organization, um, UPSO, is uh, my NASA, and so I own UnitedPlanetSpaceOrganization.com, UnitedPlanetSpace.org, they all forward to UPSO.org, but yeah, it was just my NASA that I'd stuck. I think those are both pretty awesome stories, actually. <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so about the idea of the time capsule kind of grabbing the, the aesthetic of the now, uh, do you find yourself like looking back even like a year, like how quickly does a certain style or a certain form just like really show its date? Like, because you, know, you look back and you can definitely pinpoint a time, but how quickly do you find that process happen? So like for example, that is totally Photoshop, right? Mm -hmm. But that's something that aesthetically would have been difficult to make in Photoshop, just the filters and things a few years ago. That's entirely painted and retouched in digital. But what, the, the point of this, the, the technology is getting significantly better every year. So digital artists are getting significantly better every year. And so what's interesting is that what you'll see is over the years, there's, a, there's moments where it's like, oh yeah, this is when people just started tracing stuff in Illustrator and they haven't quite figured it out yet. So it's just kind of bad, but it's very, it was great at the time. And now there's auto filters that do it so better, you don't even have to do it yourself anymore. And so now people are using these filters and then adding on top. And then what you're seeing in addition is a response to all this technology and some people are getting cruder in their approach intentionally, not necessarily cruder in style but in materials or there's a lot of, a lot more of painting coming now, like breaking away from the digital, actual physical materials. And so you, to watch these trends kind of come and go, you know, 10 years from now, I don't know, will, will all submissions be 100% digital? Probably. Uh, Michelle's probably one of the only people that did hand-painted stuff that had to be photographed, you know, which is amazing to me because I think that's just as wonderful, if not more so. So that's for me what you notice most is that as the technology changes, there's a response to it. Another question, a final question, anyone? Oh, okay, two. Go for it. So about how many artists um, were in this issue? Because I mean, a couple. There were just shy of 50 in this one. Um, I've gone as high as 200. Um, 50 is about as manageable of a number as I can deal with at this point. It's just so many characters and so many timelines. So, yeah, 50 ish. Any question? So what are goals or dreams or hopes for this in the future? Added color, you know, scents, any like dream tie-ins or where, where do you see this going? I mean, the two things. One, if I can just keep doing it, that's awesome. Because in the end I have to figure out how to pay for each issue, right? So it's either a sponsor pays for it. Many of them I've just put on credit cards and hoped to dear God I pay enough, sell enough to pay for the cricket, to pay for the printing. Um, so I would think just to continue to do that, um, and then personally, I've enjoyed the spin-off curatorial things that have come from this. So I've done a couple of shows. I've done some products, t-shirt lines, things like that. So seeing where that goes is interesting as well because I would love to actually, like I would love, I did this once in a physical gallery. It was uh, Scion sponsored it. They used to have a space in LA called Scion Space. And the artist did a theme. It was a themed show that then got added to the next issue of Aesthetic that also had the same theme. And uh, to see these types of artists that are dealing with two-dimensional spaces react, I mean, kind of like Matthew, then react to the three dimensions, I think is fascinating. So I would like to do more of that, but uh, in the end, if I can just keep doing this, yeah. well, that's, I mean, 15 years is something I never thought would be possible, so. I think that's a great note to conclude on. Could we have a round of applause for Dustin, Matthew, Gemma, and Michelle?
And I just wanted to let you know, Fasthetic is available in the bookstore, and we are going to do a book signing right now um, outside. The Playtime exhibition is going to continue until September 6th. Tonight is the summer celebration party, so we're open till 10 tonight. There, we're gonna have food trucks, Monroe Street's gonna be closed down, so I hope everybody's either gonna hang around for that or come back. Um, it should be a great party, so thank you for being here. <laughs>